coming from uh, live from Nairobi, and I'm glad to be here with you again to worship and to uh, to share as we study God's word together. So as we just begin, let me pray and ask for the Lord's blessings as we begin this uh, sermon. Our Father Lord in heaven, we thank you for your love and your care and your protection. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for each and every one of us. Lord, as you as we go through this study, as we go through your Bible, as you open up the pages, Lord, we pray for your blessings. We pray, O oh Lord, that you might teach us the many lessons that are within this story, Lord. And may you speak to us, not just us, but may you be the one speaking to us through me. Use me as a vessel. Bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'd like us to turn to uh, the Bible again. Uh, and the story, um, or what, I, what I'd like to read to you is from Genesis chapter 9. That'll be the main place uh, from where we're reading. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, uh, and essentially share experience in a, in a short sense of what this has been or what this text has been. This is, I must say, a difficult text in a sense if you are African and in my experience in sharing it even with my brothers and sisters, it really hits us hard in a way. Uh, but there's, what I know is what the Bible says, uh, what Paul tells this Timothy is, all scripture is profitable for us. All scripture. God is love. And everything he writes, there is love. There are messages to us. Some may be tough for us, but still God pushes it or sends it with a message of love. And that's what we will be going through in, in a short while in this text. Uh, before I go into it, I'd just like to share a testimony because it will enable us to have an understanding of where I'm coming from this. Uh, when I was in in high school, the first year of high school, that's Form 1. That's what we call it here in Kenya. When I was in Form 1, I used to hate history. And when I look back right now, that surprises me. Why did I hate history so much? Why did I hate the subject of history? I wanted to, in Kenya, we, you start with a number of subjects and then you drop around four or something like that as, as you progress into Form 3 and Form 4 as you do your final studies in high school. So initially I said I was gonna drop history and take geography. And whenever I look back and, and, and right now, I wonder why I, hate, why I hated history, because right now I love history. I love it a lot. In fact, in high school and towards the, or the beginning of the form two uh, year, I took one of the uh, history textbooks home and one of these textbooks was uh, talked about the Kenyan coast and the history of the Kenyan coast. In the Kenyan coast, we have cities like Mombasa and Malindi. Maybe some of you have heard of Mombasa. Mombasa is around 500 years old. It's an old city. It was our first capital in Kenya. And so I read the history about this, how this city grew, how uh, there are different contending powers in it. And this submit, uh, this, this, this story about Kenya surprised me. This story about our ancient history that I never heard about, about how Mombasa came to being, surprised me. I learned about Vasco da Gama, how he stopped in Mombasa on his route, on way to, on his route as he was traveling to India. He was going to Goa. So I was like, wow. And there are stories of pirates and the Oman Turks coming to attack the Portuguese who are trying to set up a colony at, at the Kenyan coast. And, and, and Malindi and all these stories about trades. These are all ancient things, stories about Kenya's ancient past that I had not known of and intrigued me. And after that, I loved history. After that, I just stuck with it and did it all the way to the end. But the reason why I didn't love history in Form 1 was we used to learn about the beginning of man and the theories of how the world began, evolution and the Big Bang and all these things. And in those lists, we used to uh, had to we had to memorize or cram in essence uh, this different level of of man, Kenyapithecus, Agitopithecus, all those different ones until they reached Homo erectus and all the way all the way to Homo sapiens. We had all those things we used to study, and I used to look at that and I would dispute it because to me and in my mind, I was already solidly set on the Bible on the Word of God as being the source and the authority 
and it had already described how creation was was made and how men came into being. So I'd look at the history book and I'd say, "This is these are just lies. These are guesswork," and that's why I hated it. But now, when I come, when I look back, I understand why I hated that part of Kenyan history. I mean, of 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 the history in form one in the first year of high school. And the reason was this: they were trying to claim our beginning as human beings came from some slime pit or some some accident in the universe, while the Bible had already described that. And one of the reasons why I believe this is because of prophecy, prophecy in the Bible. Now, I will share with you some uh, my screen in a, in a short while. But the reason I'm saying this is this. In the Bible, think about uh, where you are, where, uh, where you are and all the different religions and all the different beliefs or or all the scientists and all, all these people in the world with all their different beliefs. And I'll ask you a personal question. Why is it that you believe your Bible, why is it that you believe your Bible has, is more of an authority to, to life in, in general to the whole world than all the other books? Why is the Bible more, why should we believe it more than the Quran? If, if your friend who's a Muslim brings a Quran to you and you have your Bible there, why should you believe the Bible more than the Quran? Why should you believe it more than the Bagada Vita? I don't know if I've gotten the, the Hindu holy books well. But why should you believe the Hindu holy books more than you should believe the Bible? Or why should you believe the Bible more than you should believe the Hindu holy books? If an atheist came and he comes with his with his books of evolution and science and all those things, and he raised it to you. Why should you not believe the books of science? And why should you believe the Bible? What intrinsically does the Bible have that is a proof that you can believe it over all the other writings in the world and all the other reasonings and all the other philosophies in the world? Is there a reason, is there an answer that God gives in the Bible? I will share my screen now so that we can all see this. I will share it right now. And so that was the question that I have thought of. And I, when I look at it, I actually see the answer. So on our topic, harm the curse and the gospel, you will see, you will uh, soon see why this is the, the reason why I brought this topic as hard as it may be. In Isaiah 41, and in most of Isaiah, we have this challenge given by God to many of the people there. We have this challenge given to many of the people there, or many of the gods there, or many of the children of Israel who are going to worship idols and all these other things from all the surrounding nations. God gives them the challenge, trying to bring them back to their senses. And that we find in Isaiah 41 and verse 21. Isaiah 41, verse 21. It says this. Let them bring forth and show us. Just reading from verse 21, sorry. Uh, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saying the king of Jacob. Now, this challenge was to the Israelites who are worshipping or are living the God of of, of Moses and Abraham and Jacob, the God who had brought them out of captivity and they're going to all these other gods. This was a challenge he was bringing to them. And it's actually saying, let's reason this out. Uh, the Bible is, the Bible is a, is, a, is a word you can actually reason it out. You can actually, God wants us to reason. He doesn't want us to believe blindly. He gives us sufficient evidence for us to believe. And that's what he's actually calling us to do at this moment in time. And so in Isaiah 41, verse 21, he says, bring out your reasons, bring your strong reasons, all you people of Israel, bring your strong reasons. And then verse 22, it says this, let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show us the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us the things to come. Now, in that text, which is repeated in different ways in Isaiah, we have the key that gives the Bible its unique uniqueness among all the other books, among all the other religious books, among 
all the other scientific books and all the philosoph philosophical books, this verse 22 shows us what makes the Bible unique. And the first part is this, show us the things that will come to happen in the future. This is God's challenge to all religions. If they are true religions, let them explain the past, I mean the future. Let them tell us what will happen in the future. Let them tell us in advance, thousands of years before the time happens. And if it actually does happen, we will know that there are actually other gods in those religions. And then he goes on to say this, let them show us the former things. Let them show us the former things, what they be. Essentially, this part is saying this. If God is real, if God, if your God is real, if your religion is real, it should be able to explain the past accurately. And it should be able also to foretell the future accurately. And this is what God is saying. Jesus Christ himself in the gospel tells us, he tells us things that are coming to happen before they happen so that when they happen, we might believe. And so that's what the Bible has, and that is unique. And so this is what I remembered, looking back and wondering about my experience. This is why I hated history, because I knew from the day when I opened that book and I saw the evolution of man and Charles Darwin's theory saying we came from apes and all these stories. I knew I hated it because I knew they were lies, but I still studied nonetheless until I loved the remaining chapters and I passed uh, the, the history exam at the end of the day. The Bible is the only book that foretells the future, a hundred years to come, two thousand, a thousand years to come, even two thousand years to come. When it was written from book, the first book, Genesis, all the way to the end, we have prophecies. We have even prophecies that are happening right now. And I shared with this, uh, this with you a previous time before, that Genesis 3.15 is the first prophecy in the Bible. And that prophecy concerns Jesus Christ coming as a seed, as a child of this woman, the church, who will crush the head of the serpent. That's a powerful, that's a first from it, the first prophecy in the Bible. I believe the second one is about Noah. And the third one is this which we will look at in Genesis chapter 9. Now, one of the other things when I was a history student, when I was looking at, at this, I love history, as I've already said. When I look at, for example, India, I can see you have a writing script, you have, you have, you have structures built long, long time ago. You had your, your own system of rulership, even before the British came. You have all these writings and all these historical part, uh, uh, evidences or things of the past that are actually written down. When I go to China, I can see the dynasties of the, I don't know, the Ming dynasty and all these dynasties, and they're going thousands and thousands of years back. And I wonder, and I'm, I just look at that and I'm like, wow, there's so much to run, so much to study here. When I look at Japan and the age of the samurais and all these things, and I look uh, up into Mongolia and I see Genghis Khan and his, and his marauding uh, riders and all those things, I see history that is full. And most of it is written and most of it you can actually go and look back at. When I turn to Europe, I also see the same thing. I see, for example, when, you, uh, when I look at the, the history of the, of the kings of England and you can go trace them back all the way, all the way before England and Scotland were united and you can see all these kings and even they have all their names written down and it goes back 2000 years back. And all those things fascinate me, but when I, come to Africa, when I come to my continent, when I come to my home, I literally see nothing. Uh, we have our languages, yes, we don't just speak English or Swahili. We also have our, our ethnic or ethnic uh, tribes uh, languages that we speak. So that we have, but we don't have any writing system at the moment that was poured down or, or sent down from our forefathers. And when I look at the structures in the interior of, of the Kenyan coast, the biggest thing was a hut with a thatched roof. And I wondered like, where's our history? Where's our, where was our history? Where was, where was all this? I'm, I'm kind of lost and I'm kind of discouraged. But when I read Genesis chapter nine, which is a text that many people might find hurting in, in the Kenyan uh, setting, but it actually is a blessing 
it actually is a blessing. Let's go, turn with me there. Uh, turn with me to, to Exodus, I mean to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18. If you are with me there, I'd like us to read. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18. It says this, I don't have it on the text, so I will show you later on. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Verse 19, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. So these three sons of Ham, after the flood wiped out the other wicked human beings, these three sons of Noah, sorry, are the ones who populated the whole earth. So as you can look at that figure there on the planet, if there's any human being there, they are either the child of Japheth, of, of, of Shem, or of Ham. And they're all, in essence, the children of Noah. That's our, all our, 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 that's what the Bible is saying. And so it goes on to say this, verse 20, And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem, Ham, and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cast be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. So as we can see, as, as we just take a pause there, we'll be reading all the way to 29. Noah was the first person to essentially make a vineyard and make wine, it seems, and he got drunk. And, and he was lying naked and Ham saw it, but Ham did not cover. Instead, he went to tell his brothers. And so what we are told is, we can clearly see is Ham did not act in the proper manner here. And when Noah was sober, he, he came up, but he he said he couldn't cast what God had blessed, so he cast Canaan. But the thing is this, Ham's attributes or Ham's character had already been forming in this sense that his children or all his children are going to pick it. But we'll go and look at that when you see further on in chapter 10. And so in verse 25, where we stop, it says, And cast be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of shame, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So let's go back a bit and look at that. So verse 25, cast be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto his brethren. And he said, blessed be the God of Shem, Canaan shall also be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, verse 27, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So this story, as it, as it goes, is explaining the past in a way that no other book, no other scientific book or religious book has done ever. And to Africans, it seems hurting. But yet, there's a powerful truth and a powerful answer to it, and it's a powerful blessing and encouragement to us, and a powerful tool for reaching out to many people in the world who do not believe the Bible, who have not had the Bible, and who will believe it if they were able to see this and many other prophecies that come true in the Bible. So what I want to turn us back to is, look at Isaiah 41, verse 23, or just let's go back to verse 22, because it says this, let them bring them forth, and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they shall be, that we might consider them. So the Bible is saying this, like the true taste of divinity that people should worship is foretelling of the future way in advance, thousands of years, even naming people by name, even before they were born. And it's also, it's also explaining the past. And then he goes on to say this in verse 23, Isaiah 41 and verse 23. Then it says this, that when you are able to do this, that we may know that you are gods. That's God's challenge to other gods. And these other gods is a gods with small g. Small, gods with small g. 
the challenge is if you can do that, then we might know that you are what? Are gods. And so when I looked at this, and when I'd studied this, I'd studied before high school, and I said, the children of Ham, when you read the Bible and even when you search it out, begin occupying Egypt, some parts of Canaan, or what the land is, which is called Palestine right now, where Israel is, and some parts of Arabia. But mostly this whole continent is where the children of Ham are. The children of Shem are the Israelites, the Arabs, and I believe all of Asia going this side. And then the children of Japheth are the children of who? Where the Europeans are right now. So wherever the Europeans are now is where they, the children, those are essentially the children of who? Japheth. Now it's the Bible is the only one that's saying that these three are the three great races that come out of Noah and that the three races that fill the whole earth. The Bible was saying this way before. This is written by Moses. This is the first book in the Bible. And it's just the ninth chapter in the Bible. And it's foretelling things that will happen way before. By the way, at this time, Egypt was still the superpower. Moses was writing this probably in Sinai, which was still part of Africa. Moses was writing before he had gone to take out probably the, take out the children of Israel. Would say Exodus was written after the children had been taken out. So at the time that Moses is writing this, the children of Israel, the children of, uh, sorry, the children of Ham, the Egyptians, were ruling the world or the superpower of the world at this time. So take that note, because what he's going to say is incredible. So he says this, Canaan or the children of Ham, his descendants will be servants to his brethren, to Shem and to who? And to Japheth. And then he goes on to say this in verse 26, and he says, blessed be the God of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. So to the Shemites, who include children of Israel, the Arabs, and the Asians in essence, God, the God of Shem will be, blessed be the Lord of Shem, but Canaan will be his servants. And then verse 27, he goes on to say, God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. Now take note of those words. So one, just going back to verse 26, Shem is mentioned and the blessing to him, it seems concerns him having the God or the God of, of the God of the true God being amongst Shem in a special sense. And that we can actually see in verse 26. And it's stressed out in verse 27 when he's talking about Japheth. It says Japheth. So I was simply saying, this text, this prophecy say this, Ham, who occupy Africa, will be servants to Japheth and to Shem. And that was a prophecy of the slavery that would come in the future. And it goes on to say this, Japheth will be enlarged. And Japheth, you can see, reigns in Europe, in Canada, in America, in Mexico, in the whole of North America, and all the way in South America as well. All these places, Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, all these countries. And we also go all the way to Australia and to New Zealand. And even to Russia, the largest country in the world, all the way from Europe, stretching all the way to, to almost touching America on the other side. We all see this as a land of Japheth, the Europeans. And therefore, we can clearly see that that prophecy, in essence, happened just as God prophesied it. God enlarged Japheth just as he prophesied. Just the same way as he said, the children of, of, of Ham will be slaves or servants to Japheth. And we saw the Atlantic slave trade happening this side with slaves being taken to North America and South America. And we also saw the Indian Ocean slave trade with slaves from the Eastern, Eastern coast of Africa being taken all the way to Arabia and to all the other places in Asia. That has happened in tandem. Now, this was written when Ham or the children of, of Egypt were the, the, the superpower of the world. In fact, when you read this story, you don't, I, we don't have time to go on in verse 10 and, and see everything that's written there. We actually see that the first empires were built by the children of Ham. So when that's Nimrod, for example, when you look at uh, Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8, 
So when you look at all that story, and there's so much, it's so rich history that I could share. But when you look at that, God was making this prophecy that this would happen, not because God wanted to punish Ham, but he was saying this, this sin is terrible. Sin in general, any sin, however little, whatever kind it is, whether it's saying a lie or whether it's stealing, or whether it's anything that breaks any of the Ten Commandments, any little sin will essentially lead to our destruction. And that's what, even though Ham, when they began, were the most powerful empire, the, the city of Babel, which was in present day Iraq, was first built by Nimrod or the children of Ham. But because this sin caused them to lose power, we see the children of Shem coming in and Nebuchadnezzar and all these others rebuilding it again, making the new Babylonian empire. So what I'm simply showing and saying is this, this Bible text is a proof of how the world is even today, even today. But now there's an interesting thing that I want us to see. So we've clearly seen verse 26 happened as it was prophesied. And if I might, if I might also mention something about this, we still see the effects of the curse, though it has been reduced by the power of the cross. Because many of us in Africa haven't accepted it as it is, we are still taking financial aid as an African country, or African, uh, most of the African countries, uh, or the whole continent as a whole, from Europe or from North America and from Asia, from China, even today. And the Bible says whoever is a borrower is a servant to the lender. The Bible tells us to, as much as possible, avoid borrowing. Because when we borrow, we become a what? A servant to the lender. But that's, that's showing that this Bible history or this prophecy is real until today. But there's hope. I'll show you how and when, where that's, that's coming. So the interesting thing in verse 27 is this. God shall enlarge Japheth, but he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. So as much as Japheth has all these continents in the world, as much as he has all this landmass, he will still come to the tents of Shem. And then we, we should ask ourselves this question. What is that tent? What is that tent? What does that tent symbolize? What does that tent point to? Ask yourself, what does that tent point to? When we look at the history of the Israelites, when they were traveling, they had many tents. When they left Egypt and they were coming back into, into Canaan, or they were coming back to the, Lord, the land that promised had, God had promised for them, they had many tents, but they had one specific tent that was unique. And I shared with you last time when I shared with you, but I just remind you with this text, Exodus 25 and verse 8, it says this, and let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Exodus 25 verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. The children of Shem, God gave them this one thing that they had to share with the whole world. And that was that tent. And we already saw how that tent has the whole gospel written in it. How we can see the cross written within that sanctuary. How it shows us it's the hope that God had decided to die for the sins of man even before man had sinned. God had already come up with a plan to rescue humanity. We are not an afterthought. God had already come up with a plan to save us. And that is one thing we see and we can hear. So if you, if you look at, if you look at uh, the children of, of Europe, the children of Japheth, their religion, their main religion is Christianity. And Christianity began where? With the children of Shem, with the disciples in, 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 in Israel, in Jerusalem. And so this verse, verse 27, or verse 27 of Genesis 9, also is a proof of that. That God shall enlarge Japheth, yes, but he shall still dwell in the tents of Shem. This tents of Shem refers to that tabernacle or refers to the religion that, that God gave to Shem. And so the Christianity begins where with the Israel with Abraham and with his son Isaac and with his son Jacob and all the, the, the 12 tribes and it goes on all the way to the 12 disciples who Jesus Christ himself sets up. And so this is interesting that one, the, 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 the prophecy about uh, slavery and servanthood happened as 
God prophesied it. Now, the prophecy about religion has also happened just as God prophesied it. And by the way, when you look at Asia, when you look at the Middle East and Asia going around there, the world's religions essentially come from there. When you think about Judaism, when you think about Christianity, when you think about Islam, all these religions come from where? Middle East of the children of Shem. It's surprising to me, but I think it's still uh, true that we also see Hinduism coming still from the children of Asia. I, I've been reading and I had, I don't know if this is correct or not, but I had that also Buddhism itself started first from where? From India, then left or went into where? Into China and on those, all those other countries that still practice what? Buddhism. And we also have in Japan, uh, I don't know if it's Shintoism. So all these major religions of the world, interestingly, all start from Shem or start from Asia. Isn't that interesting that the Bible said from the start, long ago, that the true religion will come out from Shem. Japheth will get his religion from there. And in essence, also Ham will get rid of his religion from there. And that's what we see that has happened in tandem and in history. I'd like to read you a uh, text quickly as uh, we go through. This is this paragraph or this quotation essentially is saying uh, what this text is saying, what the Bible or what God essentially meant. And this powerful book we have, this text comes from Patrick's and Prophets, page 118, paragraph 2. Go and read that chapter. Go and read that whole chapter and explain it in even more beautiful language. It says this, the prophecy of Noah was no arbitrary denunciation of wrath or declaration of favor. It did not fix the character and destiny of his sons, but it showed what will be the result of the course of life they had severally chosen and the character they had developed. It was an expression of God's purpose toward them and their posterity in view of their own character and conduct. As a rule, children inherit the dispositions and tendencies of their parents and imitate their example so that the sins of the parents are practiced by their children from generation to generation. Thus, the vileness and irreverence of harm were reproduced in his posterity, bringing a curse upon them for many generations. And then he goes to quote this text from Ecclesiastes 9.18, oh, one sinner destroyeth much good. One sinner destroyeth much good. So this text, uh, or this, this prophecy, essentially answered my question. And when I was going to high school, I was like, no, if the Bible really had this a long time ago, then we can believe the Bible. We can definitely believe the Bible. It is higher than all these other books. So when these people came with the theory of evolution and I was studying it in our high schools, and I, was, and I have friends, by the way, who even after high school or within high school had were wondering like, should I believe evolution or should I believe my Bible? Should I believe the creation story or should I believe evolution? Everyone in all the science, all the smart people in the world who are scientists, who are professors in the universities, in the colleges, all say that science is, is correct and the Bible is fables. They say Genesis chapter one to verse 11 are all fables. They're all fairy tales. But as you and me can see, this is no fairy tale because it has happened as God said it would. And so coming with this to high school, that's why I didn't like the first part or the first year of history because it was all evolution and big bang and how people came from apes. And by the way, why I'm saying this text is, is a powerful text, why I'm saying this text is a beautiful text, why I'm saying this text is something that actually proves true religion or or, or our faith in God is not a, 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 a mist or something like that. In our high schools, in our, in our, in our textbooks, they used to say that we, as Africans, or the, our, those who live in current day Kenya, or we call them Bantus, we came from Congo. That's what they say, they came with, we came from the trees. And they mix this with the theory of evolution. They mix this with the theory of evolution because they say, they mix this with the theory of evolution because they say that God, uh, or they say that man uh, first started as an ape. And so in the Congo, in, in the Cameroon, in the place where we have the rainforest, we have the big trees. 
they say that men was apes. And as we were moving towards the savannas, which is what we have in the East African coast, that because there were no trees, man had to stand upright. And so the theory of evolution essentially says that in essence, African men or Africans are the lower or the, the earliest form of man. And so it in a way is dehumanizing or it's denouncing us. When you look, when you think about the theory of evolution, all races cannot start at the same time. When you read Darwin, Darwin's thoughts on the books of evolution, he actually says this, that the other races are lower than the word, for example, the Caucasian race or the Europeans. And so the Europeans should conquer and subjugate the other races who are lower than them. That's what evolution teaches. I don't know why scientists have not denounced those parts of Darwin's theory. And if the Darwin is correct, and he was working on or, or speaking about that uh, racism, essentially, that's racism. Why do scientists still hold on to his books? Because that is so wrong. They should throw away all of Darwin's, because if Darwin is wrong on the racist part of his book, The Theory of, of Man, or The Theory of, of Evolution, if he's wrong on that part because of the racism that he has, then could he be wrong in all the other parts? So with those thoughts in mind, I said, no. Our history as Africans might, must be different. And I'm saying this so that it can encourage, it can encourage all, all of us. Uh, I'm saying this so that it can encourage all of us. So not only is that, uh, that as it is, what I also discovered is this. Our history as Africans, though we don't have it in writing as the, you in India might have your past history of the people in Burma or in, or in Laos, in Thailand, in China and in, in Japan and the Europeans and, and, and all these other parts. May, while we might not have all that, we actually have it installed in the Bible. Now, I've been reading my Bible and I've actually been finding when I read the Hebrews, some words that are actually Bantu that are actually in the Bible. And when I also look at Egypt, I also see the traces of our African uh, interactions or African uh, building, actually the pyramids and all those all those uh, artifacts in where? In Egypt. Science wants to disprove that because it has a racist basis and says, no, this could not have been built by Africans. If it's not some Caucasian or something like that, then it must be aliens. That's what they say. But the reality is the Bible itself says that Egypt was the land of harm. And you can search that out and actually see it. So what we see is that the Bible holds our history and it says we were at the top or we were building empires at the past and then we fell because of sin. But it doesn't end there. As we draw to a close, as we draw the, the session to a close, uh, uh, there's this text from my life today which says this, nearest the, throne of, nearest the throne are those who are once zealous in the cause of Satan, but who plucked as brands from the burning have followed the savior with deep and intense devotion. This is, a pro this is God seeing into the future and he sees this. This quotation is essentially telling us this. God likes to hold those close to himself who are so close or taken up by Satan. And so to a certain time or to a, a greater extent of, of time, the devil wanted to destroy Ham, wanted to destroy these children of God. But God has plucked him from the devil's hand and he's going to hold them close to himself. Now, this I'm applying to harm per se, but you can apply it to yourself, whatever race you are, whatever culture you are, whatever level you are of education, wherever you are in the world, it also includes you. Have you fallen into sin and far away from God? God wants to hold you close. The Bible says, Jesus says, that those who are forgiven the most, love the most. Then wherever you are, whoever you are, how far you've fallen to God, turn back to him. He is calling back on you. He wants to hold you. And that is what this text is pointing us to. And so what the devil wanted to turn for bad in lowering and in bringing to slavery the children of harm, God is turning it out for good nonetheless. One, we have this powerful promise or prophecy that clearly shows us that the Bible is real and is unique above all other books. We can believe the Bible. We can believe it. If you have any other book uh, or any other thing out there that shows prophecies highly in advance, well articulated, put out as this, 
share with me and I might even consider joining your religion. But so far, having gone through the world and looking at this challenge that God puts to the whole world, I see no other prophecy or nothing else coming close to it. And so I can believe my Bible. He goes on to say, this is another uh, text from Christ's Big Lessons. We can't read the whole of it. But it goes to say this, I'd like to read you the second line or the, the third line, which says this, it starts with the word hearts. Hearts that have been the battleground of the conflict with Satan and that have been rescued by the power of love are more precious to the Redeemer than are those who have never fallen. Have you had conflicts with temptation, with Satan in your life? God says this, your life is worth more value than those who have never fallen. That is the angels and the many worlds that have not fallen. God is saying this, he values us more than those who have never fallen. And in essence, even in the, in the Bible, it says that we will judge angels. In the Bible, it says God will lift us up to sit on his throne. Jesus wants us to sit on his throne. That's in Revelation chapter 3, the promise to the church of Laodicea. That's the promise to us. Essentially, God is going to bring us even higher than the angels. But the angels will not feel bad. They will be happy with us taking that closer part, humanity taking that closer part to God. Because the angels do not have prejudice. Pride and prejudice are the sins, the main sins of this world. Every sin in the world, I would say, comes from pride. And the center of pride is I. It's the same thing as the center of sin. It is selfishness. It is I, I, I. Because of racism and all other prejudices that people might have, whether people are looking down upon others because of, because of their religion or because of their race or because of their level of education or their wealth or even their caste, all those manner of looking down upon other people is wrong. It is out of pride and it's out of sin. God wants us to look at others higher than ourselves, to love others as Christ loved us willing to die for others. That's why Jesus says, no greater love as this than a man should lay down his life for his friend. God is our friend. He wants to lay down his life for us. Similarly, we should love others and go forward and do much for them, even risking sometimes our lives so that they too might gain life. I can't say much. Uh, this text is already powerful in itself, but maybe you can just look at this figure. If you look at this figure, in, in Matthew, chapter 20, Matthew chapter 27, as we close, Matthew 27, we will read two texts, chapter 32, chapter 38, and chapter 50, I mean, Matthew 27, sorry, Matthew 27, we will read verse 32, verse 38, and verse 54. The reason why I have this up and I have that figure up there is this. The cross unites these children of Noah. And, and it does so in a powerful way. First in verse 32, we see Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross. And it says this, verse 32, Matthew 27 and verse 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. So we can see Simon of Cyrene bearing the cross. And before we actually told that Simon did actually, didn't actually believe in Christ. But because he showed compassion when he saw Christ whipped and struggling with the cross, he decided to carry it. He was, he was held by the Romans, but he sh showed an expression in his face that he had sympathy for Christ and therefore he was he held the cross. And so we see Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene was in Libya, in Africa. We see Simon the Cyrenian, child of Ham, bearing the cross. And then we go on to see in Matthew 27, verse 38, Jesus is crucified with two, thie two thieves. One accepts him, one does not. These two thieves were Jews. These two thieves were, in essence, Asians. These two th thieves were in essence the children of Shem. One of them accepts Christ. At that point when Christ is going to die, one of them accepts Christ. And, and that we see in verse 38, Matthew 27 and verse 38. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. I will not read the whole story, but we know this. 
that one of them said, hey, stop abusing Christ. Can't you see we're here guilty because of what you've done? But Jesus Christ is not. And then he says to Jesus Christ, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus promised him that he indeed will get that blessing, that, that prayer, his prayer has been answered. And so we see another son of Shem accepting that promise on the cross, the very day that Christ is on the cross. And then finally, it ends beautifully in Matthew 27 and verse 54. When Jesus Christ has died, they've pierced him to check whether he's dead. They found out he was already dead. The earthquake has happened. The darkness was there on the cross. The earth shook. There was a strange feeling around everywhere. We see the final representation of the children of, of, of Noah accepting the cross as well. Number 54. This is a child of Japheth, a Roman. Now when the centurion, this is a Roman centurion. Now when the centurion, now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. Now the desire of ages puts it wonderfully. I don't have time to read it to you, but when you go and read that desire of uh, ages, on this chapter of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And if you don't know this book, uh, find the organizers of this uh, 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 church worship, this worship we're going through, Final Herald, and ask them to share that copy with you. But Desire of Ages says that it was a, a sign of the power of the cross that on the very day that Christ died, three people varying in all respects accepted him. I believe that his respect was in terms of race, in terms of geographic uh, origin, uh, location of originality. All those things in, in culture and all that. We see the child of Ham, we see the child of Shem, and we see the child of Japheth accepting the cross. And right now, what we see in the world, as many Africans accepting the cross, is they are beginning to go back to Europe, to many of the people who brought Christianity to, to Africa, like David Livingstone, and all the the missionaries. Now it's the time for Africans to go to Europe to take the message back. And so Africa, this land that the devil wanted to destroy, was in essence also the place that Israel or the children of Israel when they were in famine, when Jacob and Abraham and Isaac used to come for refuge. Jesus Christ himself, when he was born, had to run away from Asia or from Israel and come to where? To Africa, to forward for refuge and to go back. Similarly, God has arranged it in a way that he has also given as much as he's given all the other races work to do in spreading the gospel. He has also given the children of harm the work of God, taking the gospel back to the people who brought it back here and to all the other places, including the many places in Asia that haven't had the gospel. That's the power of God. And so that's a powerful thing that I want to show you this. We can believe the Bible. God has a mighty and powerful plan for us. And he gives us a powerful uh, promise to each and every one of us who are the part of the church in this last day. I just like to read it because it's powerful that we can close with it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. He wants us to overcome sin. Any sin that overcomes us, any sin that we dally with, like Ham did. These are many lessons we can get from this story. One, racism is wrong. God does not excuse it or any form of prejudice, whether it's according to caste or wealth or education or anything. That is wrong. God says, however you treated the least of this, that's how you treated me. So if you treat someone badly, whether it's a street boy, or whether it's a poor person, or whether it's an, an educated person, the way you treat him, remember that that's the way you're treating Christ, because you're treating him in person. It's in Christ that you're actually treating. There are many lessons, but one of them is also that if you don't overcome sin, it ends up affecting our life and the lives of our children. And this affects anyone across this globe. But verse 21 of Genesis of Revelation chapter 3 says this, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I'm set down with my father in his throne. This is Jesus' promise to us. If we overcome, this is what the angels, angels are, there's no angel sitting on the throne with Christ right now. Satan wanted to sit on that throne. But God said no. 
But God, because we had fallen and he has raised us up, no matter how far you have fallen, God will still raise you up if you turn back to him. And the promise here is this, if we overcome through his power, we will sit with him on his throne. So I just want to leave you with that thought. All the prophecies of the Bible are real. And we have seen it. And we can see more if you study Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation. All these other prophecies in the Bible, they are real. They have happened. We can see them in the past. We can see them in the future. We can see them even happening right now. And it, verse 21 then gives us what I would say is a most outstanding, almost hard to fathom prophecy. That we will sit with Jesus on his throne. Why should we love the things of this world, the music, the entertainment, the wealth, the dress, the fame, the sins of this world, the loss of this world, and reject that which God is showing to us and is encouraging us? Overcome, and you'll sit with me on my throne. My prayer to you is that you accept this. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for that which you have shared with us. Thank you for this Sabbath day. May we be strong. May we turn to you. And may we see the powerful blessings and the promises that you have in your word. Lord, we have seen the, that your Bible is true. That it has a challenge that no other book, no other science book, no other religious book has attained to or even challenges. May we believe it, may we study it, and may we share it with others with love that they too might come to believe it, Lord. The times are ending. There are many people who are dying without knowing you, and they need to know it. Forgive us for not sharing this truth that we should. Help us to overcome so that we might sit on the throne with your son as you have promised. And help us, Lord, not to harbor prejudice in any way in our hearts. Cleanse us and let us walk in the path that you desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.